Good afternoon. Welcome to the first of this semester's Fridays at One. Uh, we hope to invite you back to the following, the other programs in the series, and are particularly happy today uh, because the speaker really has encapsulated most of our lives and has helped to change the world we live in. I'm Michael Markowitz. I'm director of the Institute for Retired Professionals, which is a learning program at the New School, which is 50 years old and dedicated to the idea that older students can govern their own education, can make a contribution to it, and can work in a program creating with others a, a new knowledge. Today's talk is sponsored by the IRP in memory of Estelle Tolkien, whose family helped us to bring in outside speakers and to bring in people with different viewpoints than we normally see, with different histories and with interesting histories. The Fridays at One program is run by two IRP volunteers, Ava Vogel and Jane Osmer. Jane will introduce today's speaker. We really encourage you to find out more about the IRP. There are clipboards in the back where you could give us your name and we will send you invitation to future events. Thank you. Okay, Florence Howe is with us today and she founded the Feminist Press in 1970. She came to the women's movement after several uh, of her involvement, much of her involvement with the civil rights movement and that's how she happened to come to the women's movement. She can be called the mother of the women's studies movement. Uh, she was an early observer of the, uh, the development of feminism. The author of an anthology of women's poetry and the politics of women's studies, her involvement was unending. Her recent book, A Life in Motion, speaks of her personal journey, her professional life, and transports us across class, gender, and race. She will speak of her life and her book and share the feelings of her memoir. She will also speak about breaking rules. She just told me breaking rules. <laughs> so that sounds great, and we don't know what that is exactly, but it'll be interesting. And her book is available after the talk over on the side. So please welcome Florence Howe. I want to thank particularly Phyllis Kriegel, who couldn't be here today, I think, uh, for suggesting that I speak to you, and Jane Osmer for her warm welcome. Through the 1980s and 1990s, I was the publisher of a series of memoirs, some by known writers like Mina Alexander. When Alice Cook, one of my authors, insisted that her book, A Lifetime of Labor, be subtitled an autobiography, I accepted her stricture and never thought much about it until I realized that for her, the word autobiography meant that she would not have to write about her private life. And indeed, she spent two or three pages on her marriage and three paragraphs on her divorce in a 350-page book. Still, I continued to maintain, when questioned from time to time, that there really was no difference between memoir and autobiography. When I retired from the feminist press in 2006, I saw my work as writing a book about my life and the 40-year history of the feminist press. Despite my experience in energy, however, I thought I needed to consult a professional editor for some cold-blooded advice. My consultant said first that I had to make a significant choice. Was I going to write a memoir or an autobiography? Further, she added, I was too old to write an autobiography, <laughs> for that would entail years of research. Perhaps, she then suggested, I could write a memoir simply from memory. That is, if I could write. 
I told her that I had two different kinds of stories to tell. And for one of these, the feminist press, I did have rapid access to research in the files of correspondence, records of meetings, and reports. I also had 40 years of journal keeping, mingling my personal life and my work life. So why not write a history of the feminist press? Because there was a backstory. How it came to pass that at age 40, when I was enjoying teaching English at a private women's college in Baltimore, I upended that life by founding the feminist press. My consultant merely repeated her formula, you must choose before you can write. From her perspective, autobiography was history, filled with facts, dates, events, famous people, all realized in detail. Memoir could be vaguer, need not offer proof, simply good writing, as in fiction. I paid my consultant, did not tell her she had made me furious, which was helpful, for I felt convinced then that I had to do both. I had to break the rule, if it really existed. My book had to be both memoir and autobiography. I knew I had memories that were as brilliant and detailed as this morning's sunlit view out my window. And I knew also that I had years of journals and documents for other kinds of information I could not easily write or remember. I will mention only briefly the question of could I write. The press's continued sales of the backlist attests to my ability to choose good writers to publish. But was I a writer? In my last year at Hunter College High School, an English teacher told me I was her favorite because I didn't have a creative bone in my body. <laughs> I took this as a compliment and continued in college to cite this teacher as reference for my lack of a creative bone. And yes, at 77, when I began writing this memoir, I was still wondering whether I could grow that creative bone. But I had no doubt about my ability to break rules, even some of my own making. This is the way the book opens. At 80, I am as invisible as my maternal grandmother was on the streets of Brooklyn in the early years of the 20th century. I think of her as I board a bus mid-morning, filled with old people like me, anonymous, dressed in comfortable clothes, all but one or two clearly not headed to an office job. When someone stares at me, I know it's because of the white streak in my dark hair. And sometimes a woman will ask whether I have dyed my hair for effect. No, I say, the white has been there since I was 14. I dye the rest of it. <laughs> Once a young black woman with a streak of white told me that hers came from a great aunt. I tell interested people that my grandmother had such a streak though I don't mention that her head had turned snow white even before I was born, when she was perhaps in her late 30s. When I went white in my mid-40s, I thought I'd dye my hair till I was 60. Then at 60, decided that 70 would be the right time to stop, but put it off once more. And now I've stopped thinking about giving up the white streak in my dark hair. Certainly, it's not convenient or economical. So it must be vanity, and the occasional pleasure that comes from a particular kind of recognition. Old acquaintances, even my former students, recognize me, often saying, you haven't changed a bit, when what they really mean is that my hair hasn't changed a bit. <laughs> My beloved grandmother, 
opens the book. And I'm going to read you a tiny, tiny bit about being with her. And this is one of those memories that I'm sure you've all had, that crystal clear, even though you were a small child. On a sunny Saturday morning, hand in hand, we walked to the small synagogue near her apartment. I'm wearing the freshly starched new white linen dress she has made for me with the navy blue yoke piped in red. Half a block away, we walk through an alley to the rear of the building, against whose sunny wall a few young children are playing. She opens the door and begins to climb the steep steps, checking at each step that I am following her broad figure. We enter the small women's section, an alcove hanging above the men below. A few of the women seated in hard chairs are seemingly praying, moving their bodies back and forth as they chant, even as the men move and chant below. But most of them are simply sitting. It is very warm and airless. Baba sits and I sit as well, but soon I am squirming and she whispers in Yiddish, go, go downstairs and play with the children. And she reaches into a pocket, draws out a handful of hazelnuts, and gives them to me. I go downstairs. Once again, I remind myself that she could not read, that perhaps none of the old women upstairs could read. And I have to remember also that the short, stout, old woman with white hair rolled into a bun was no more than 44 that year. She taught my hands the cleverness that had saved her own life and had earned money for her young family. By the time of her death, I could knit, crochet, and embroider. She died when I was seven. She sewed dresses for me and knit sweaters all the years she lived. I still have the miniature marvels of elegance she made for the Shirley Temple doll. Most of all, hugged to her ample body, I felt her love for me. As a brief contrast, here is my mother. The war in Europe was a reality that for the first time I heard about directly from my mother's mouth, for she announced one Sunday to my father, loudly enough so that I could hear her, that she had taken a job in an airplane factory. It's a good job, she said, and we can use the money. Your daughter is old enough to look after her brother. She always called me your daughter when talking about me to my father. I enjoyed that label. My first tiny rebellions at age 10 were bred in this newly arranged household. My refrains are whining, it's not fair. I didn't mind washing dishes and making beds. I didn't mind picking up my father's clothes from the floor where he had dropped them and carrying them to the hamper in the bathroom. But I asked again and again, why can't Jackie, my brother, put his dirty clothes into the hamper? Why does he have to throw them on the floor? Because he's a boy. He's learning to be like his father. Boys do what they please. They don't have to make beds or wash dishes. And to my steady refrain of that's unfair, she had one steady response. Life's unfair. Get used to it. I also had a fun-loving, taxi-driving father and a scholarly rabbinical grandfather who taught me to read and write Yiddish and to read Hebrew for three years after my grandmother died, before he died. Even before I entered kindergarten at five, I was a reader, and I knew I was going to be a teacher. I also wanted very much to be a mother, possibly like the mother I could see cuddling and, yes, loving my baby brother, but not me. Two educational institutions changed my life. 
Hunter College High School moved me out of my working class Brooklyn speech patterns into the voice you now hear. And Hunter College's motto, Mihi Kura Futuri, the care of the future is mine, provided an antidote to my mother's life's unfair, get used to it. At Hunter, I became an activist in the mid-1940s, joining with other students to form the first interracial, interreligious house plan and then sorority in the country. We did break rules. At Hunter also, a professor and the college president insisted that I needed to go to graduate school, not teach in a high school. And they both helped me to get there, to the graduate school. By 1960, I was an assistant professor of English at a private girls' college in Baltimore. And this time, it was my students who turned me into an activist. This is how it happened. In the spring of 1964, one evening in the dining hall, where I often joined friends for dinner, Students at the table asked whether I could give them a lift to Morgan, uh, to a shopping area beside Morgan State College. They were going to a demonstration organized by Morgan students who were trying to integrate the barbershop and the movie theater adjacent to their campus, a black undergraduate state institution. Could you drive us after dinner, they asked. Of course, I responded. The demonstration was only five minutes out of my way home. Six students crammed into my small car, and I dropped them off in front of the movie house, where there was already a small picket line in progress, up some steps, and a large crowd below heckling. I drove off, meaning to leave directly, but then I saw a parking space and thought I'd just walk back to make sure the students were all right. When they saw me coming, they began to applaud, thinking I was joining them. How is coming? How is coming? They chanted. Too embarrassed to tell them that I had acted as a mother, I joined them. The students' faces were jubilant. Mine must have seemed worried, for they assured me that all was going well, and that I was to ignore the hostile comments and jeers, to keep moving and chanting with them. The next day at lunch, a group of faculty greeted me with anger. How dare you lead students astray, one woman asked. Why are you urging students to break the law? I was mystified. How had the news traveled so quickly? I tried to tell them the story, but they were not interested. They wanted to know only whether I was going to tell the students to stop breaking the law. What law, I managed to ask, still mystified. No one answered me, for there was no law that prescribed Baltimore's segregation, only practice. A year later, and I should say that in between, the president of the college, who was a libertarian, a wonderful man named Otto Krauschar, discovered that I had done this and assigned me the task of bailing out the students who got arrested from time to time. <laughs> and so I, I did that all year, and the students were uh, very active in Baltimore, as were many other student groups in those times in 63 and 64. A year later, I decided that I would go <clears throat> to Mississippi to teach in a freedom school. I made the decision before the three young men were killed, but like a thousand other people who went down that summer, I didn't change my plans because those three had been killed. We all went down just the same. <clears throat> Once in Mississippi, I was assigned to Jackson, probably because I was 
considered old. I was about 34 that year. And most of the people who came down were in their early 20s. And uh, because I was considered old, I was given what was thought a safe place in Jackson, a school um, in the basement of a church. And I was handed a curriculum, uh, an amazing gift, uh, written by Charlie Cobb, a young, in his 20s, black guy uh, that I never met that summer. Uh, the curriculum began with plumbing, an elegantly strategic choice, since all might be assumed to have used plumbing, or as it turned out, at least to have seen it. Since few, if any, were experts on plumbing, no one could teach it if teaching were assumed to be lecturing. Thus, I sat on that first morning with a group of 15 middle school girls and boys and asked the questions as if I were following a catechism. The first question felt strange coming out of my mouth. What bathrooms do white people have in Mississippi? To my amazement, almost all the hands shot up and everyone looked eager to participate. I said we would move around the room and everyone would have a turn. For more than half an hour, I heard very detailed descriptions of tiled or painted walls and of various floor coverings, including rugs, of tubs, sinks, cabinets, showers and shower curtains, mirrors and medicine cabinets, their size, color, and other special features. Descriptions included ornaments on shelves and windowsills, pictures on walls, patterns on shower curtains, and initials on towels. I listened in silent amazement, at least partly aware that my expression encouraged the speech of these students, while I continued to wonder where they had gotten their information. Not one young person had refused to speak. Still puzzled and uninstructed about how to deal with the responses to the first question, I went on to the second. What bathrooms do black people in Mississippi have? Several students described outhouses very briefly, often with embarrassment without using the words outhouse. Some simply said the word none. In the curriculum, the next question was why? Why do these differences exist? I asked the question, trying for no affect, simply as a request for information. Why are these bathrooms so different? Understandably, these young people were baffled about how to answer beyond the obvious fact of white dominance in their lives. But I was more baffled than they. How had they come to know so many different white bathrooms? And so my curiosity would not allow the morning to close without my asking directly, how is it that all of you have seen white bathrooms? More than 45 years later, my ignorance may still seem shocking. On that first day, I was learning more than the students who were being kind to a strange white lady like me. I helps my mother when she clean on Saturday, said the first young girl. Even the boys admitted to going with mothers, sometimes to help with the heavier chores, sometimes staying out of school to do so. Always they had taken note of the bathrooms. At once I understood the double-edged power of Cobb's curriculum to educate both the northern white teacher and the southern black student about the realities of race-segregated life in the U.S. The point was not to preach, but to cause both teachers and students to think. One of my students that summer, along with a small group of high school girls, they were about 15, maybe some were 16, began to write poetry. And I want to read you one of their poems. 
Uh, this is a poem written by Alice Jackson, who the following year I got to adopt. She is now a 62-year-old lawyer who lives in Mississippi with, you know, and she's my daughter. But here she is at 15. I want to walk the streets of a town, turn into any restaurant and sit down and be served the food of my choice and not be met by a hostile voice. I want to live in the best hotel for a week or go for a swim at a public beach. I want to go to the best university and not be met with violence or uncertainty. I want the things my ancestors thought we'd never have. They are mine as a Negro, an American. I shall have them or be dead. I was wowed by that poem, uh, as you might imagine. And I went back to teaching white, middle class, very privileged young women at Goucher College in the fall, wondering why they wrote such boring essays and why it was that the black students who had very little training in punctuation, sentence order, I mean none at all, had hardly ever read a poem, were able to write poems and had read very little great of what we call great literature, could write some sentences that sounded very close to great literature. How could this be? And I thought and thought and thought about it and realized that it was very clearly because they had a subject and my white students did not. And I couldn't put my head on their shoulders. I had to find a subject for them. And so I sort of rooted about for a year and continued to teach some fiction in my writing courses. But I taught in a different way. I put the chairs in a circle. I did not lecture about anything. I asked what I considered were open questions in the manner of Charlie Cobb's curriculum, questions that I couldn't know the answer to. And I tried to improve their writing. I wasn't very successful to begin with. But then one day in 1965, I accidentally hit on the key question that not only changed my teaching life, but changed my own consciousness. Uh, well, in Mississippi in 1964, I was the 35-year-old who told the 20-somethings to shape up and sweep the floor and make the coffee, else I would do it. I told them they were selfish, all these young women who were furious because the young black and white men had sort of locked them out of political discussions and told them to get lost, make the coffee, sweep the floor, that they were in charge. I told them they were selfish, these women, that the race issue was the primary issue, and only when that was solved could women think about themselves. Clearly. I was then no feminist, nor did I know that I was repeating the errors of 19th century foremothers, who also thought you dealt with one question and not the two. But in 1965, in this classroom that has remained inscribed in my brain, um, I was discussing D.H. Lawrence's Sons and Lovers. You may all know that book. I was trying to provoke students to see point of view. I wanted them to see that the action in the novel occurs from the point of view of Paul Morell, the male hero. I wanted them to see that they could see Miriam and other women in the novel only through Paul Morell's eyes, never through the women's own per perspective. So I began asking them to imagine how Miriam's parents might have responded to her telling them that she was in love with Paul Morell, that they had had sex, and that she was pregnant. 
What would her parents say? My students just stared at me. No one would speak, and they were again sitting in this circle. I said, were there clues in the novel to help you imagine how Miriam's parents would have treated her? Silence. I explained that this was an open question, that I didn't know the answer. I wanted them to think about what might be the answer. I told them again and again that I was really interested in Lawrence's point of view. I just got to be very, very impatient, finally, because they continued to look puzzled. In some exasperation, I asked the question that became key to my teaching of composition, as well as the development of my own feminist consciousness through the next several years. What about your families, I asked. What would your parents have said? How do they treat you? And how do they treat your brother? Of course, one student volunteered at once. We are always treated equally. We went round the circle, each student more emphatic than the one before. Even those with no brothers said that their parents would have treated them equally. I knew at once that I was on to something, for I remembered vividly my childhood complaints about unfairness. I asked a series of questions about allowances and gifts, tasks around the house and payment, cars, driving, hours, and other matters. Soon differences began to appear. Even as we went round the circle with each question, the students became more and more visibly agitated and defensive. I wouldn't want to mow the lawn, one student said, and I don't care if my brother gets paid for doing it. I'd rather do the dishes and not get paid. Anyway, another student said, I don't need money as much since my dates pay for me and my brother needs to pay for his dates. Probably none of us in that room understood the significance of those differentials about money and the social structures they defined. Nor could we grasp the significance of the sister's need to be home by a certain hour and the brother's ability to stay out all night if he chose. We did not talk about sexuality at all in those early years. Just before the hour ended, one intrepid student said, I really don't want to talk about such trivia, knowing that I was accepting of seemingly outrageous statements in class. Fine, I said, then I will assign these topics as themes for this week. I want you to write about what you were supposed to do, either socially at home or on campus, and what you think your brother is supposed to do, even if he is younger than you. The students groaned, frowned. No one was smiling but me. I knew I had found the subject I was looking for, though I did not yet have the right books with which to stimulate discussion and writing. For four years, beginning in 1965, I pursued what I thought was my job, improving the writing of students through having them consider the topic growing up female. I was not a member of NOW. I did not know about radical feminist groups in New York. I never referred to myself as a feminist. And then in 1969, a reporter came into my classroom who then put my photo on the front page of the Chronicle of Higher Education beside a headline saying, I was teaching consciousness to my students. I objected, but no one would hear me, not even my students. And more than 40 women wrote to ask for what they called my women's studies composition syllabus. Furthermore, some of the students I had taught in composition entered my 18th century literature class and asked why there were no women on the syllabus. Had a typist left the women out by mistake, they asked. <laughs> I had to admit my ignorance. And when I went to the library, the librarians also admitted their ignorance. What was to be done? And I leap now to the chapter in the book called Founding the Feminist Press. 
And I'm leaving out, you can ask me in the question period, how I knew that this was important to do. It's a, another whole story about the Modern Language Association and a study of the status of women and who did, you know, who were the students in English who earned BAs, who went on to do MAs and PhDs, and how it was that 80% of the gradu undergraduate majors in English became 20% of the PhDs, and the males, you know, the males reversed. 20% of the men who were majors in English as undergraduates became 80% of the PhDs. How did that happen without any uh, discrimination? It was just a matter of course, that is, women chose not to go on. Why was that true? And the only answer I could figure out eventually after a huge study of, of all of this with two sociologists who were trained to do this kind of study of 5,000 departments of English and modern languages and so on. The only, the only cause I could find for all this was the curriculum. The curriculum was entirely male-centered. So this is why the feminist press finally appeared. But it didn't appear in the form, you know, sort of immediately. It grew. In the spring of 1970, I was invited by three different academic presses to write Doris Lessing's biography. To the directors of each press, I described the persistent questions my students were asking about the lives of women in literature, history, and other fields. I wanted to produce a series of 100-page small books by famous contemporary women about women of the past to whom they felt some connection. For example, I said, Doris Lessing, I was sure, would enjoy writing about Olive Schreiner. While the editors were interested, their financial managers were not. Each used the same language to dismiss the idea, saying there's no money in it. Then I took the project to Bob Silvers at the New York Review of Books, where I'd been publishing essays. To his credit, Silvers was interested, but his money manager said exactly the same thing. There's no money in it. When nothing came of these meetings, my husband suggested I do it myself. I could call it the feminist press, since he would be a part of it, and feminist was a non-gendered word that included men. I heard him say the name, and something about it convinced me to go to a meeting of Baltimore Women's Liberation and ask whether they would work with me on such a project. A group of 20 heard me out, and then each person around the circle responded, some with enthusiasm, none said they would work with me. And so they were too busy doing other projects. It was not that they didn't like the idea, but they wanted me to find somebody else to work with. At that point, I gave up. I went to Cape Cod for a month, and I came back at the end of summer 1970 to find my mailbox stuffed, this was my junk mailbox, stuffed with the mail addressed to the feminist press, 5504 Green Spring Avenue, which was my address. My first class mail had been forwarded, uh, but this, I was just going to the mailbox to throw away. Usually I would find only flyers, ads, and so on. So, uh, I understood after opening the first few envelopes, one of which contained a clipping from Baltimore Women's Liberation's newsletter announcing the start of the feminist press. <laughs> As I opened more envelopes, it became quickly clear that in the manner of what was in fact a feminist revolution, 
Other newsletters have picked up the Baltimore group's announcement and had repeated it endlessly in their own mailings, for these letters came from all over the United States. Women were eager to work on this project, they said, either by writing for it or by buying the finished products. Some of the envelopes contained a few single dollar bills, others contained small checks. At first, altogether, there was about $100. At first, I was simply angry this had been done without telling me. Then I was furious when I realized that in addition to biographies, the announcement claimed that the feminist press would publish children's books. <laughs> I had never said a word about children's books. I knew nothing about them, and I certainly did not want to be responsible for publishing children's books. By the end of the month, I had simmered down enough to invite everyone who had written to the feminist press, asking them to attend a meeting in my house. If at least 25 people came who would agree to attend regular meetings and work on this project, then it would begin. If not, I wrote, I would return all the money sent to me. On the late afternoon of November 17, 1970, Fifty people filled the living room comfortably, most of them sitting on the gold carpeting that had come with the house. Most of the meeting was taken up with introductions. Leah Hines said she was there because her seven-year-old daughter had asked for a book that depicted a woman doctor, and she admitted that she was the person responsible for adding children's books to the description. She had searched bookstores and libraries and found nothing, though she knew that women had been doctors since the 19th century. As we went around the room, it was clear that while no one had experience in publishing, no one seemed awed by the tasks before us. The room crackled with energy. In the mail, there had also been two proposals for biographies from writers who could not attend the meeting because they lived in Atlanta or Massachusetts. Right on the spot, various people suggested that I accept those authors. Then Mary Jane Lupton, a professor of literature at Morgan State College in Baltimore, rose from the floor to introduce herself and to say shyly that she was already at work on Elizabeth Barrett Browning. Several people urged her to continue. From the start, it was clear that we were going to make decisions by consensus rather than by voting. The spirit in the room was convivial. I can remember thinking that it all seemed too easy, as though no one was thinking about the work involved. But I did not voice my fears, assuming that this was going to be a movement project with a lifetime of a few years until something else came along to replace it. From the first I imagined that regular publishers would seize on the idea once they saw it in action. The only formal business of the meeting was deciding that we would meet monthly and that we would begin to work on children's books at our next meeting. Now, do you want me to continue for another 15 minutes? Yes. Okay. Uh, or I, I could stop here. Uh, Sometime during the following week, I received a small packet of Ch Chinese children's books from a friend in Canada who had heard about the formation of the feminist press. News did travel very fast in those days when we had no internet, remember? No internet, no cell phones, and yet there was this packet of Chinese children's books. She knew, as I did, that Chinese imports were then illegal in the U.S. Among those books was one called I Want to Be a Doctor, the story of a little girl who was a doctor and her younger brother who was a nurse. Together they attend a sick rocking horse using a saw and a piece of wood. I knew the talents of Barbara Danish, who had filled my goucher office with the paintings of dragons and a large paper mache dragon that hung from the ceiling. So I gave her the Chinese book, urging her to produce an American version without dragons. 
The Chinese are generous, I said. They won't mind our copying their book. Barbara returned to my office within 20 minutes with a few sketches for a story called The Dragon and the Doctor. Although I groaned to hear the title, I couldn't resist its clever appeal. At the December meeting, when Barbara presented her story, the mothers in the room were even more enthusiastic than I had been. What remained of the Chinese book was the distribution of work. The female sibling was the doctor, the young male the nurse. Barbara's wounded dragon had a zippered tail, which when opened and emptied of a tennis racket, a ball, a roller skate, and a portrait of the dragon's grandmother, served as a seat for the two children who then visited other reimagined creatures of the animal world, all of whom spoke, as the genderless dragon did, in a vowless non-language, Burke Smirch, for example. Still, we faced two obstacles, how to get the book printed in color and how to raise the money to cover the costs. No one mentioned publicity, marketing, distribution, or sales, for this group lived entirely outside the publishing world. But these were the early days of an ebullient women's movement in which news traveled quickly without the internet. Some people volunteered to find lists and write fundraising letters that described the book and the need for money. Barbara and Laura found a small printer in Baltimore called Quickie Offset, whose owner offered to teach them how to prepare color separations. While the book's contents were written in less than an hour, and while the several thousand dollars needed to pay for 5,000 copies were raised in a month, the process of production lasted almost eight months. The Dragon and Doctor and the Doctor by Barbara Danish, the first feminist press book, was published in 1971 and is still in print. For our 25th anniversary, Barbara enlarged the story to include two mommies among the animals, and of course, it was banned in Virginia. <laughs> Two external events changed the history of the feminist press dramatically within four months of its beginnings. I'm not going to read much more, but I'll just tell you what they were. First, Tilly Olson sent me Life in the Iron Mills, which was our first reprint and which established what really made us famous. It wasn't the children's books. It wasn't the biographies but it certainly was the restoration to the uh, American and international literary canon of the writing of women, much of which had been done in the past by you know, our ancestors all over the world and then lost or abolished or deliberately vanished by men for the most part, I have to say. Much as I love men, uh, there, you know, back there, men did not love women who were writers. So uh, that was the first shift. Uh, immediately, we had a third. In addition to biographies and children's books, we had the reprint series, which, of course, in fact, made us famous, right? For 10 years, we were the only people doing that. Uh, the second thing that happened was that I had to leave Baltimore for personal reasons, and I moved to Old Westbury. And though I didn't want to take the press, I didn't see it uh, as the potential that it was. So, and I'm quite honest about how blind I was to start with. Uh, the president of the college I was moving to, the college at Old Westbury, his name was John McGuire, was more visionary than I. When I asked for permission to bring the press along with me, he said, it's the most important thing you have to bring. And of course, I thought the important thing, things were the grants I had from NEH and so forth. 
and that would help me start women's studies. And indeed, they all did. But his view was that the press was really very important. And I guess I could end by, uh, in two ways, uh, with the publication of Life in the Iron Mills, the Yellow Wallpaper, and then The Daughter of Earth, all within a year, the feminist press had a huge field to mine. And it was clear that we also had a huge burgeoning field of women's studies, eager to read excellent women writers who had disappeared for reasons we would now call sexism. So at last, I could call myself a feminist. There's more to this story, 40 years more, and much of it moves overseas in part through United Nations conferences, through work in translation, and through especially massive work and publishing in India and then in Africa. I want to return to the theme of breaking rules. The volume ends not with the history of the feminist press, but with my private life, a memoir of caring for my mother's Alzheimer's, my sustaining friendships with four particular writers, <clears throat> my finding a chosen family of New York friends to replace the absent biological family. I conclude also with the idea of home and break one rule. I used to say that I had no home, but that I could be at home everywhere. In fact, once when I was interviewing Doris Lessing, she and I agreed that that was the kind of person we both were, that we were at home anywhere because we really had no home. But I conclude this, whatever it is, Book. <laughs> I conclude this book by breaking one more rule. I finally, at the end, I challenged the idea that I'd always had that I wrote best when in a new, strange, or even temporary place. I often said I would never have written this memoir had I not gotten an award to Bellagio where I wrote seriously for the first time, and that was certainly not in my own home, and that I wouldn't have finished it if I hadn't gotten a second award at Bellagio. But the chapters that were most painful to write, the ones on my mother and my father, I couldn't write in Bellagio. I got terrible headaches, and I had to just quit writing them and wrote other things there women's studies chapters, for instance. But I had to write my mother and my father at home in what is now my home. And ultimately, writing this book allowed me to embrace the concept of home. And I'll read you just the last sentence of the book. I read you the first sentence. For me, very late in life, home is this palpable space I am fortunate to inhabit in New York City on West End Avenue, where thanks to my community of friends who have become my family, I can live and write. Thank you. I am very happy to answer questions. Yeah. I hope some of you are writing books. <laughs> yes. Could you tell us a little more about your relationship with the rest of the feminist movement, with NOW and with some of the other things? Well, I, I'm a member of NOW now, but I certainly, I don't even know if I knew about it when it began. That's how distant. Baltimore was not on the front lines. It's a southern, sleepy city. And uh, so I was very central to 
the women's studies movement, that's true, and to the organization, the organizations that it spawned. But I was never an activist in now. Yes. How did ERA affect you and your organization? ERA, Equal Rights Amendment? Oh, the ERA. Yeah. Well, I spent a lot of my time uh, focused on Title IX. Do you know Title IX for equal opportunity in schools? And I didn't really work on ERA, and I was sorry that I didn't when it was lost, when it was over. But I thought that my job was to work as hard as I could on uh, educational matters, to focus on Title IX and women's studies and changing the curriculum wherever I could. So I got deeply enmeshed in uh, international work at the UN with other countries on questions um, of including women in the curriculum from elementary school through high school and college. Okay, she's next. Um, okay. could, could, I know that now the feminist press is under the umbrella of the City University of New York. Can you tell us uh, how that happened and what the significance of that is for the future of the feminist press and uh, feminist publishing? Well, when I left Baltimore, the feminist press left my house. Nobody in Baltimore wanted to keep it in their house. And so it went with me to the college at Old Westbury, where the president was very generous then the chancellor was very generous, but we had a fire there. Some crazy people tried to burn us down. Um, we, right. <laughs> uh, and they, they did burn half the place down, and I knew we had to leave. It was too isolated. There was too much hostility. This was in the middle of the 80s. Uh, the fire was in 83, I think. And we left in 85 and moved into the City University of New York. And here, for the first time, we had a contract in perpetuity, eventually. A contract with the City University that said, in exchange for their paying the salary of the director, who was then me, uh, and releasing me from teaching, which I did not have at Old West. We didn't have any contracts. There was nothing written down at Old, at Old Westbury. Uh, we would put the City University's name on every book we publish and on every piece of advertising, or we would try to get it even on reviews. So, but if you look carefully, you will see that we are the feminist press at the City University, not of the, which means that we have to pay our own phone bill, we have to pay our own mailing costs, we certainly have to pay to print the books, we have to pay authors, we have to pay for publicity, for the internet, and so forth. So we need to be fundraising all the time. Um, what is significant is that without the housing and without the salary of the executive director, we might not be in business in these very hard times. So it's very significant. We are extremely appreciative uh, to the City University of New York. We have a loving relationship uh, with the chancellor and with many of the presidents and deans and faculty members. Uh, who are very supportive of our work. And of course, we do publish many uh, city university writers. Yeah. Yes. Um, you mentioned that at the beginning, it was very much a uh, consensus by which you made decisions. Yes. Uh, I presume as the press grew, that became more difficult. 
I don't know that, however. Oh. Does it continue to be that? Well, you know, one of the things I track that very little attention has been paid to is what happens to a feminist organization as it grows. And uh, I really believed in this consensus. And I, of course, I was a member of SNCC. And I, that was the way SNCC worked. And of course, it has its downside. I mean, you had to be able to last for 12 hours without going to the bathroom or going out for a drink of water because uh, that's the way SNCC meetings went. You didn't ever vote. You waited for consensus. And consensus you know, could come at odd moments. And people kept talking. Uh, obviously, that couldn't continue. And it didn't continue. But we didn't really have an external board until 1979. And I tell that story, and I had a kind of love-hate relationship with staff members because I was the only academic. And I was away from the site at Old Westbury for two years. I was on leave in Ohio and Massachusetts. And the president wanted me to stay and wanted the press to stay. This was in 78, 79, 80. Uh, and I was not clear about what I was going to do. And my own personal life was mixed up in this, too. So it's, it's pretty complicated, as you will see if you read the book. Did you have anything, any uh, contact with Ms. Magazine? Uh, they, in the beginning, Ms. Magazine ignored us. Hmm? Huh? I don't know, and I was not pleased about that. But of course, they had their own fish to fry, so to speak. But uh, when Robin Morgan became editor in chief for a short period, maybe four years, things changed quite a lot. And now we have very friendly relations. In fact, just a year ago, what month is we're in February? A year ago, January, that is, a year ago from this past January, Ms. Magazine gave the first party for my book in their Los Angeles home. It was a beautiful party and set up like this in a very lovely room they have in their building. So in the beginning, um, Things were not so the way they are now. Um, have you published or are you planning to publish books by or about women in their later stages of life? Well, I have to tell you that once in the early 80s, I was about to be picketed at um, I don't remember whether it was, I think it was the Modern Language Association's annual meeting. I was going to be picketed by a bunch of women who thought I was unfair that all the books I had published, you know, the opening books. Now, Life in the Iron Mills, if you've never read it, is really about a man. It's not about a woman at all. And it's not a feminist book in any sense of that word. But it's a great <laughs> Book. I mean, it's as great as Tolstoy. It's incredible. And if you haven't read it, you should read it. But um, all the books that came after that, like Daughter of Earth, were about growing up female. And I wanted them for my students, obviously. And I was interested in anything that could be uh, seen at, at, to affect young college students, because uh, I was still teaching. And I cared about finding this lost curriculum for my students. So it was true. I, didn't, I hadn't published many books uh, about older people. But then I began in the 80s. And a whole group of books uh, are, if you write me an email, I will 
put you on to the group of books I published in the 80s, which are all about women over the age of 70, I would say. So there are as many books like that in the feminist press holdings. Uh, and they're all there still. You have to go online now because there isn't money enough to do a big catalog the way we used to do big catalogs for the backlist. Yes. Um, it's obvious that you have been very active in various of the movements. Uh, and uh, there are new movements now, like Occupy Wall Street, the Arab Spring, the women's movement is still active. How do you think that activism uh, is changing or should change in order to be effective at this time? Well, I have to tell you that my, uh, my goddaughter and her boyfriend are very active. And now they're in their 50s, and they're very active. I'm not anymore. But my African colleagues, especially in Egypt, uh, have been very active. Uh, these are the people with whom I did one of the, the big Women Writing Africa books, uh, The Restoring of African Writing. And I cheer everybody on and write newsletters about who is doing what in various parts of the world. So I've become a cheerleader, you could say. Uh, what do I think about it? I'll just tell you what Marietta thinks, This, um, my goddaughter, who is further left, I think, than I've ever been. She thinks that it's just a joy to see her students, because she teaches at Catholic University, to see her students as activists out there with her in Washington, that um, she thinks the activity itself is meaningful. I don't know about that. I certainly had lots of activity myself in many demonstrations and uh, <coughs> gassings and that sort of thing. I'm not sure that the activity itself does it. I think you have to think you have to think about what it means, and you have to try uh, to do your best to teach others what it means. but it's it's not simple. It's pretty complicated. Did you choose to dedicate your book? And if you did, why? Why did you choose? Well, Tilly Olson spent her time before she succumbed to Alzheimer's telling me that I have to give up the press and write. She kept telling me I was a writer. I didn't believe her. I believed that my job was finding writers and publishing them, not being a writer. And she was terrified that what happened to her would happen to me. She was a very facile writer in her 30s, 40s, 50s. And as she got older, it got much more difficult for her to write. She used to tell me that she'd have to go away. She could never write at home because, and I couldn't write while I was married. I couldn't write in my own house because in your own house, she explained this to me. She said, even though Jack said her husband, was a loving, wonderful man. Even though Jack said he could fend for himself, she felt responsible for him, and she could not write in the place in which she was supposed to be wife and mother. So she'd go away. It would take her three weeks to adjust to the new place. And, you know, that's true. She could write for three weeks if she was lucky and had a six-week appointment. So she worried that I would freeze up, too. Well, that hasn't happened. I'm a very facile writer still, and I'm 82, about to be 83. And I'm not at all frozen. The question of what to write, what do I want to write next, is that's a difficult one. I think we have time for one more question. And then oh, I could. There are only two hands sure, up, I think. Yeah, 
Um, <clears throat> where do you suggest uh, one would study, for example, the top three schools offering uh, anti uh, feminist uh, studies now? The three top schools? Two top schools, whatever you like. Well, I don't know. It's very hard to say. The biggest or the best or what is it you want to study? I mean, the problem is that feminist studies is... I used to say I was regarded as uh, very old-fashioned because I didn't think feminist studies or women's studies, whatever you wanted to call it, was a real graduate school major, that you had to major in, in something a little narrower and that, that it was a cut of the whole academic cloth. I still think that to some extent. And so the graduate programs in women's studies that I have visited recently, because they wanted me to talk about my book and read and so forth, they've highly specialized themselves. If you want to do literature, for instance, you probably wouldn't go to one place. You would probably go to another place. If you wanted to do uh, sociology and feminist studies, you would go to where the sociologies people was strong. So you don't, there is no major called feminist studies. You have to decide what you're going to do before I can tell you. I know there are very strong p programs uh, at the University of California at Berkeley, at Los Angeles, the usual places, at Santa Barbara, uh, there's a wonderful program at the University of Washington in Seattle. And I'm sure there are wonderful programs here at Rutgers. Um, but not in New York. The graduate programs I'm talking about, PhDs. Last question back there, yes. anything but you, you getting this in your last statement um, I I'm, I'm from the area that you talked about and I was very active in the civil rights movement I'm from Alabama and I left school doing the sit-ins and I came to New York and I have a propensity for being wherever the action is and I can remember when I was in school and they went to integrate the courthouse in Montgomery and we led um, demonstrations in front of the Capitol and then um, I've collected all the newspapers and I still have them and I've been thinking about writing something about that. I was there when Malcolm X made the statement, chickens coming home to roost and it was taken out of context and I went to Reverend King's funeral. I was a young teacher here in New York at the time, and I went to Atlanta, and we were afraid that the house that we stayed in, which was owned by very rich white people who in, in Atlanta who invited us to stay in their home while we were attending the funeral, and we thought it was going to be bombed. We thought the house was going to be bombed. And I, I have all this material and I've been considering writing, and I haven't. And you said something in the last sentence, just before you were about to close, that gave me the inspiration, and I think I'm going to get it together just from hearing you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.